Hello everyone. Welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. So we just started our 11th week of lectures on nonlinear adaptive control. Um, by now we have covered a large variety of um, methods to design and analyze algorithms. Uh, that will drive autonomous systems robustly, um, such as the SpaceX satellite that you see in the panel. Um, so I hope um, you have found the exposition of nonlinear adaptive control interesting. Um, and I hope you will continue to be with me until the end of the course. So um, what we were doing last time is uh, that we started to look at um, a particular method of adaptive control, uh, which allows us to uh, sort of relax the persistency of excitation condition. So as we sort of discussed a little bit last time, uh, persistency of excitation is a rather you know, strong requirement uh, for identification, which, uh, well, until recently was thought to be sacrosanct. So now, what we want uh, to do is to do this kind of real-time parameter learning without having persistence of excitation, but with a weaker sort of condition. So in order to do that, we, I mean, in order to understand that, uh, of course, the reference was this work by Shayan Roy, uh, Shubhendu Basin, uh, and Indra Kar. Uh, they, of course, have a lot of subsequent work in this direction also, uh, which I would strongly urge all of you to look at. Very interesting stuff. Um, so one of the, um, well, I mean, we, we started to look at a very simple setup, of course, uh, for illustration. Yeah, we like to see these basic problems, but we've also seen in the past, and I hope you're convinced by now, that even if I give you a vector problem, uh, things are not going to be significantly different. All right. So uh, we started looking at a single integrator system, right? Uh, and a single integrated tracking problem. Honestly speaking, we didn't even go to the tracking aspect of things until now. Uh, the first thing we did was we wrote everything in a standard redresser parameter form, that is y theta equal to u. And because we wanted to write it in this form, we had to resort some to over parameterization. So we had to introduce one also as part of the unknown parameter vector. Um, and there was also x dot in the uh, regressor right now um, you know what what essentially this x dot uh, signifies is uh, the derivative of the state which is typically not assumed to be measured all right uh, but then we also showed that uh, this filter itself is implementable right by using a simple integration by parts type of a scheme right um, and we even you know wrote out a nice formula for this this integration by parts kind of a scheme, okay. Um, then very reminiscent to what we were doing in uh, you know projection based adaptive controllers, uh, all of these were motivated by Slotin's work in the eighties. Um, is is that we uh, we sort of uh, tried to connect the filtered variables, right? We sort of wanted to write the equation in terms of the filtered variables, and again in uh, very uh, you know reminiscent of our projection-based adaptive control scheme, uh, the filter equation turns out to be very similar to the original equation. Yeah, and this is also looks like a standard regressor parameter form, just that the y and the u have been replaced by the yf and the uf. So uh, Slotin already showed that these do improve performance. We also saw the same, the creation of an attractive invariant set, and we did the projection-based adaptive control, but it does not allow us to relax the persistence assumption, okay? which is why um, these authors who we are referring to now um, proposed addition of a second layer filter. All right. So this is where we sort of start today. All right. So um, 
So the second layer filter, um, we saw the structure already, pretty uh, standard. It's like, a, you know, yif dot is governed by minus yf transpose yf with zero initial conditions. And uif dot is governed by yf transpose uf with zero initial conditions again. Um, so one thing to note is that yif is always going to be uh, positive semi-definite. Okay, I think we have to change there is a sign issue here. So this is actually a plus, otherwise it's not positive semi-definite, but negative semi-definite, right? Yeah. By construction, this is positive semi-definite, right? Because you start with a zero matrix and then you just keep adding a, a non-negative definite matrix, yeah, non-negative definite symmetric matrix, yeah, as the derivative. And therefore you, of course, have positive semi-definite YIF. Um, we do a similar exercise. Now we try to come up with the equation in terms of the yifs and the uifs, right? So in terms of the second layer filtered variables, right? And in order to do that, I as usual multiply both sides here by theta, right? And if you look at this, this yf theta, uh, you know, from our previous analysis is already uf. So I substitute the same here. And again, you notice that y i f theta zero is zero, right? And if you see this equation and this equation are exactly the same, with same initial conditions, just the variables are differently named. So here you have u i f, here you have y i f theta, right? So therefore, the, by uniqueness of solutions of ordinary differential equations, the solutions of these two also have to be the same which means that y i f theta is exactly equal to u i f. All right. So this is again very similar to the previous equation. In fact, as you can imagine, the authors were smart enough to construct this so that such property, such a property does hold. Okay. That's the whole idea anyway. Okay. So the construction is precisely uh, so in order for this kind of an equality to happen okay great now that we have designed these two layer filters we are now going to actually look at the control problem which we sort of neglected until this point right great so what is the uh, error dynamics it's e dot is e ax plus u minus r dot right and uh, of course, because we have new parameter theta, we want to write everything in terms of theta. So we write this as z times theta plus u minus r dot. And now, in accordance with our standard certainty equivalence step methods, uh, we propose our uh, control as minus z theta cap plus r dot and a nice negative term ke right, with some positive gain k. And with this, what we will get is uh, that E dot is minus Ke minus Z theta tilde. All right. So as usual, we get this nice error term. Right? Now, the interesting thing is, um, the way we specify the parameter update law has no connection to any Lyapunov analysis. Right? So this is again similar to the projection-based method, but there it was motivated in a different way the choice of the update law. Here, the choice of the update law is, of course, motivated in a different way. In fact, it's completely decoupled. We just have two terms. So here, mu f and mu i f are some positive gains, some positive scalars, if you may. And then you have y f transpose u f minus y f theta cap and u i f minus y i f theta cap. All right. Now, if you use the fact that uh, uf is yf theta and uif is yif theta. Yeah, in fact, the filters were constructed very smartly so that such a thing holds. And if you substitute this here and this guy here, you will get this mu f yf transpose yf theta tilde from here and mu i f y i f theta tilde from here, right? Where of course your uh, theta is, sorry, theta tilde is theta minus theta cap. 
okay so this is a rather cool thing why why is it a cool thing one thing you already see is that uh, i did not have to uh, i mean even in the sigma epsilon modification we introduced some term in theta cap right so uh, by the way i mean before i go further here we had a theta cap dot and here we have a theta tilde dot which is minus theta cap dot okay so that is why you have a negative sign here all right that's it that's why we have a negative sign going from here to here as simple as that so now um, in the earlier sigma and epsilon modification type designs if you notice theta cap dot and also theta tilde dot of course did contain a term in theta cap right that was the whole idea behind sigma modification and epsilon modification that you have this a cap type term yeah of course if i write a tilde dot also i will still have an a cap term okay but look at what happened here by virtue of a very very neat filter constructions i don't just have a theta cap i actually have a theta tilde here yeah theta tilde dot equation contains a theta tilde from this term and also from this term and not just that i already know why if is already positive semi definite so this is already a non positive term here so something really nice so unlike sigma epsilon mo modification where i only had a theta hat in theta tilde dot equation here i get a theta tilde in a theta tilde dot equation right which makes this like a very very nice evolution with a very high chance of being asymptotically stable right and why was this possible this was possible or this was made possible only because of this kind of relation if we did not write it in this regressor parameter form initially which was y theta equal to u if we did not do this over parameterization i would not get uf equals yf theta or uif equals yif theta right and because i did that and notice the uf is implementable because it is just a one filter one layer filter of u and uif is just filtering u uf so obviously these are all implementable quantities so i have used exactly implementable quantities nothing are implementable but because of the regressor parameter form standard structure y theta equal theta equal to u which i started with i could get theta tilde z and now this is looking like a very nice system it looks like theta tilde dot equals minus k theta tilde just in a simple case right this anybody i mean most of you have seen non linear control now for almost 11 weeks more than 11 weeks will understand that this looks like a very promising system okay which can be asymptotically stable all right excellent yeah excellent this is i mean so that's why i marked this this is the magic this is where the magic has happened yeah and this magic has happened because we started with the regressor parameter form and then we constructed smart filters yeah not we but he stroke some idea really constructed smart filters okay so great uh then we of course i mean uh, do some lyapunov analysis yeah um and how do we do it we this is very standard i take an e squared by 2 yeah Uh, i have nothing to choose anymore i just need to do the analysis yeah. nothing remains to be chosen anymore only the analysis part remains correct great so i hope you understand so then i put a put a constant lambda this again is something that you should remember from your projection based adaptive controller analysis also i put some arbitrary constant lambda just for the analysis remember it is not appearing in the control law it's not appearing in the update law because all of that has already been chosen yeah so there's nothing to be chosen anymore this lambda is only of use for the purpose of the stability analysis okay yeah. excellent so i just substitute for e uh, this uh, from here i get e dot and i get this guy and then from here i get lambda times theta tilde transpose theta tilde dot so which is this with this nice negative sign and then uh i know for a fact that this is positive semi definite why because it's a inner product it's like x transpose x 
So Y F transpose Y F is positive semi definite, right? So this is, right? So this is positive semi definite at least, yeah, because the symmetric matrix. So real eigenvalues, it's a symmetric matrix constructed out of a inner product. So like a non, so again non negative definite, right? Uh, so we know that. So we use this fact to sort of get rid of this term. We don't even use this in the analysis. Okay. So one might ask why introduce this term, yeah, if we did not use it in the analysis. So in, in this next step, you see that I have dropped this term and I only left with this term, kept this term. So these two come in as it is. Right? So this term comes in like this. This term comes in like this. I have replaced this with norm bounds. That's it. But this term I have removed. Why we keep this term? in the update law is because it improves the numerical performance. This has been shown and proven. So this definitely improves the new, this term in the update law does improve the numerical performance of the adaptation law. And so it makes sense to keep this. Yeah. All right. Excellent. So, uh, <clears throat> so now if you look at it, I'm left with these three terms. Um, and now we talk about the initial excitation property. So, um, we say that this wire is initially exciting, i.e. with constants T sigma 1 positive, if this inner product, yf transpose yf integrated from 0 to T is greater than or equal to sigma 1 identity, which is a positive definite matrix. So, what does it mean? It means that even if yf transpose yf instantaneously is not guaranteed to be positive definite. In fact, impossible, right? Because if you remember, yf is r1 cross 2. Yeah. So if you multiply, so it's it's at most rank 1. So yf is at most rank 1. So if I multiply, and again, yf transpose is also at most rank 1. So uh, it's it should be obvious to you that um, at each instant rank is at most one, right? Because the product rank of the product of matrices is the smallest of the rank of each of the matrices involved all right so here yf is the only matrix involved it has rank one so the rank of the product can be at most one okay but what we are claiming is that if i integrate from zero to t there is sufficient rotation this is the same thing that we talked about in persistence excitation yeah if i but the thing is that here i integrate only for a finite from, from time zero to cap t okay as opposed to this uh, if i wanted to write now, uh, yf persistent excitation, yf is PE with, with the same constants, if I say, with T sigma 1 positive, if, this doesn't look like a y, yeah, if uh, integral T to T plus cap Y F transpose tau Y F tau greater than or equal to sigma one i greater than zero for all T. Yeah. So the difference. So I have sort of made a slightly different kind of definition of persistence than what you would remember from class because I don't put a lower bound. And there it's an outer product, it's yf, yf transpose instead of yf transpose yf, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. First of all, I we discussed this even when we talked about, uh, you know, persistence excitation that the lower bound, the upper bound is not so critical. Yeah. The upper bound is only for the purpose of talking about boundedness of the signals. Yeah. The lower bound is what you will find in all definitions of persistence for sure. So the lower bound is the only key thing to be honest. Um, and then. Uh, 
the fact that we use inner product versus outer product doesn't matter because I can always talk about persistence of the transpose. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, as simple as that. So, but if you look at the big difference, the big difference here is that you need this condition to hold, this, this positive definiteness condition to hold for all small t. Here there is no small t at all. No small t. Right? So you want it to hold only for some initial window. Here you need to hold for all sliding windows. If I, if I take a window of time of size t and I keep sliding it, in every window if I integrate this inner product, it has to be positive. Right? Okay, so that's a very stringent requirement compared to the initial excitation requirement. Okay, now what is well known? Um, so if, if if you have this condition, if you have this initial excitation condition, what do you know? Yeah, if you look at the solution, yeah, let's look at the very easy, right? Let's look at uh, the solution of the y i f equations. Right. So y i f dot was simply y f transpose y f with initial condition at zero to be equal to zero. So what is y i f of t? It is actually zero to t y i f transpose tau sorry y f transpose tau y f tau d tau and if you look at these two you match these two they're exactly the same they're exactly the same same integral so what does it mean it means that if i have initial excitation on y f then if the small t is greater than equal to cap t y i f has to be greater than equal to sigma 1 identity just by comparing these two if you compare these two you see that if the small t becomes larger than this capital t then y i f for that value of small t has to be greater than equal to sigma 1 right because this integrand is always non-negative always makes a non-negative contribution cannot reduce yeah if you have a value of y i f capital t to be sigma 1 i which is what you will have from here, then the value of y f t beyond capital T time will also have to be greater than or equal to sigma 1a. Yeah, just by the virtue of how this evolves, as simple as that. So, because of this initial excitation, which is a significantly less stringent requirement than persistent excitation, yeah, the, the, it's, it's evident in the names itself. Persistent means always exciting. And Initial means only initially exciting. Yeah. So it can be boring later on. Completely fine. All right. So, so for initially exciting signals, you will have y i f to be greater than or equal to sigma 1 i when t greater than or equal to t. Okay. So in this v dot expression, I can have, I, I replace this quantity by sigma 1 i. Right. I replace this quantity by sigma 1i and of course then I also uh, you know use this fact I, mean, I use the sum of squares so this is less than equal to half e squared plus z squared by 2 theta tilde square so of course I use the sum of squares also and I get this expression beyond time t greater than equal to t it doesn't matter what happens until time equal to t less than t because until the, it's only it's a it's only a finite uh time therefore the system would have expanded only a finite amount it doesn't matter how much but a finite amount right and beyond that i have this nice kind of a result right now you would ask you would sort of think that this is you know this is time varying and because it contains the state, right? What is Z? Z contains the part of the regressor, right? That contains this guy. That is not a constant. So now how do we deal with that? That's where the lambda comes in. That's where the lambda comes in. So here, of course, if K1 is greater than half, I'm done. Here, I just need the lambda to be large enough to dominate this, right? Because mu IF is, of course, in our hands also. You can also choose mu IF to be large. 
Uh, but sigma one is not really in our control. It depends on the initial okay. excitation properties of the signal. Right? But if you choose lambda large enough, suppose you fixed mu i f and fixed sigma one is out of control. But if you choose lambda large enough, then you can dominate this guy. And once you dominate this guy, you know that v dot is less than or equal to zero. So v dot is non-increasing. So sorry, so v is non-increasing. V is non-increasing, states are bounded. States are bounded, then this bound continues to hold with some large lambda. And the most important point is this lambda is not required for the implementation, it's just for the analysis. So this domination is given. It's pretty standard, pretty straightforward. Okay. So once we have this, we have nice negative terms in E and theta tilde. Yeah, this is under the initial excitation condition. So this is a big difference from uh, our certainty equivalence control where you never get a term here like this theta tilde. This term happens, comes about very in a very straightforward way when you have initial excitation because uh, of the fact that this update law contains the theta tilde. Right? For the persistence excitation based control, this theta tilde term doesn't show up very easily. Yeah, there you have to prove uh, results using you know UCO conditions and all that. We already saw that. Yeah, so it's a little bit more complicated. Theta tilde does not show up in the adaptive control. Here it does, and because it does, uh, the Lyapunov analysis also becomes more straightforward. All right. So this is uh, of course nice. You have nice negative definiteness, negative definite v dot, and which immediately means that. Uh, you have some uh, nice exponential decay in fact because your v was also in uh, quadratic in e and theta tilde and v dot is also negative quadratic in e and theta tilde so you have a nice exponential decay so a pretty strong outcome i would say and uh, therefore you can have convergence of both e and theta tilde exponentially right so that's what i would say both e theta tilde converge exponential right so pretty strong result here so um, so that's that's what it is right? the certainty equivalence uh, sorry the initial excitation based adaptive controller right um, great so what did we look at we sort of continued our discussion on the initial excitation based adaptive controller we saw the second filter layer of course uh, then we constructed the update law, which uh, interestingly brought about theta tilde terms, nice negative looking terms. And we know that if there is an initial excitation condition, which is significantly less stringent than the persistent excitation condition, uh, we have nice negative definite terms in the theta tilde dot term. And this helps us to prove exponential stability of the system. Uh, so we have exponential stability of E theta tilde dynamics, which means that both E and theta tilde are going to converge exponentially in time. Yeah. So of course, all this happens for T greater than or equal to T. So this is something we have to remember. Uh, so in initial time, there may be some finite expansion of the system, which is okay. It's still finite. Yeah. Uh, this behavior can also, of course, be governed by choosing gains appropriately and so on. All right. So in the next uh, upcoming session, we'll continue our discussion, of course, on initial excitation uh, based adaptive control. We'll look at higher order systems and things like that. And so I hope uh, to see you all there in the subsequent session. Thank you.